Was it medical billing? No, I had no clue how to do medical billing. <laughs> that's what I stuffed my foot into, but that's okay. We figured it out, we got it done, got the sentence taken care of, and she was my friend. She is a person I love. Sorry. <laughs> and if you ever need anything, I'm here. Okay. I'm going to give you Sarah, who's her eldest daughter, and she's going to have a few words to say. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to celebrate the incredible woman that was my mom. Um, I wasn't boring on my memory. It's my greatest push, so I wrote down a few things to say. Um, my mother was so full of life that, in truth, she never really cared about death. Mom loved and was deeply invested in the business of living. Making the world a brighter place came naturally to her. Mom found her joy in simply bringing the light to bringing the light to those around her. Mom was funny, sarcastic, and delightfully quirky in all the best ways. When I mean delightfully quirky, I mean she made voices for our cats, Bella and Ariella. And since I was seven years old, I thought cats would talk. <laughs> <laughs> And now, my cats at home talk to me in my imagination in the voices of characters that she created from her childhood. Mom loved to cook. My sister Joanna said, Mom's cooking was her purest expression of love. Dad told everyone and anyone about her kitchen prowess. Mom will always be the love of the friend. To say he worshipped her would be an understatement. Dad lived to make mom happy. In the kitchen, he was proud to simply be her sous, sous chef and let her order him around. It was adorable watching the two of them poke fun at one another as they prepped for family dinners. Mom loved nothing more than feeding people, whether or not they were even hungry. <laughs> mom was very proud of her family, her cute cats, and her extended family, which included many other children in the neighborhood whom she called her extra kids. I feel such pride when I think of how many people were loved into being and who are where they are today just because they knew my mom. There was not a life around her that she did not elevate simply by being who she was. One of the earliest life lessons my mom taught me was that senior citizens are libraries to be treasured. Just like her, I love listening to people share their life story. One of my greatest pleasures of the last few years was listening to my partner, Jason's grandmother, Rini, tell me stories of being a little girl in Austria. She has since passed on, but I know that I appreciated her words so much more because of the values my mother instilled on me from an early age. When we were very young, my mom worked part-time as a cook at a senior center that was located in Montessori School, which used to be located on St. John's Place in 7th Avenue. My sister's job was just to be her adorable, charming self and entertain the clients. My mother never stopped praising her girls and cooking classes to everyone. She was a Joanna was as adorable as she was mischievous, and my mother loved to pull on that fact. Since I was older, I helped with the dishes, but mom made sure we were both in the lunch line with our little hair nets doing our parts. It was my job to hand out the bread and butter. <laughs> My sister, and I know she gets this from my mom, is to this day one of those magical people that light up her room. Even in childhood, the charm was boundless. Mom took great pride in showing us all and loved to take me to the bakery for breadsticks because the little old lady who ran it couldn't get enough of the way I said, please and thank you. <laughs> so she also adored her nieces, nephews, and great nieces and nephews on both sides of the family. But her crowning joy were her great nieces, Cindy, Cindy and Alexa. Mom would glow every time she came home for taking them to the American Girl Factory or some other special outing or family function. At their eighth grade graduation party, Sydney stuck up behind her with a hug. My mom talked for days about that after and about how those girls just made her feel so special. I am so grateful for my cousin Jacqueline for sharing her amazing daughters with both family and for allowing my mom to experience grandma vibes. She deserved it. In college, I worked for a day camp called Camp for Kids and was assigned a five-year-old group. Mom had the great idea to have an adopted grandparent day. We got to work collaborating, and what we came up with was a tradition that lasted for three summers at Park Slope Geriatric Day Center, 
The seniors would sing, you are my sunshine to the five-year-old. And we taught the kids to sing, I'm going to make you love me by the Supremes. <laughs> so the dance number was, the number was adorable. I would recreate it, but I'm not that musical and I don't want to break anyone. <laughs> it was really beautiful to watch the Playa Playas light up with the kids. And I think that first adopted grandparent day was the first time I truly felt the joy my mother felt watching her charges light up with light and enthusiasm. I finally understood. My mom also taught me that, yes, even after a diagnosis like Alzheimer's or dementia, there is life. No one plans on being a caregiver for someone with dementia. But my mother-in-law, my ex-husband's mother, Shirley, had Alzheimer's disease. For 20 years, I was Shirley's primary caregiver. I know for a fact how lucky I was to have the expert, my mom, a phone call away with patients, contacts, connections, and unending support. My mother was not only my mom and my friend, but she was for me what she was for many of you here tonight, an ally in the unwieldy fight with Alzheimer's and dementia. I lived the benefits of you all here tonight. I know that because of the New York Memory Center and many people she helped along the way, her work will continue. And on that note, um, one more thing. So on the night of her passing, my dear friend from high school, Billy, reminded me to take comfort in the fact that my mother not only found her purpose, but lived it. And she would an honor if she that. And I agree, what an honor. And with that, I would like to invite my sister's friend, Rob, up to read a poem and talk about the time he worked with my mother. <sighs> I first met Josephine over a decade ago. I uh, was coordinating a series called Where Poetry Lives, which is actually still um, online, in which the U.S. poet laureate traveled across the country to see poetry being used in unexpected ways. The first stop happened to be just a few blocks from my home at the New York Memory Center. We'd set everything up for the shoot when I found out that the center's executive director was also the mother of our dear friend, Joanna Brown. On the day of the shoot, I was as eager to meet Josephine as I was to begin the series. I still remember her greeting us at the front door. I remember how warm and engaging she was and how she helped connect us to everyone inside. I also remember seeing in her a sense of commitment that I recognized in Joanna. And I saw what Josephine's work meant for the participants in the Center's Alzheimer Poetry Project as they proudly recited poems from memory by Emma Lazarus, Marion Moore, and William Wordsworth. In honor of Josephine and to celebrate her love for our current season, I would like to now read a poem by W.S. Moore. It is called Spring. The glass stems of the clouds are breaking. The great flowers are caught up and carried in silence to their invisible mouth. A hair of music is flying over the line of old lakes from which our eyes were made. Everything in the world has been lost and lost, but soon we will find it again and understand what it told us when we love Thank you. Okay, so next up, we would like to invite my mom's great niece, Sydney, is going to come up and sing the prelude to the Sound of Music, one of my mother's favorite movies. So, Sydney, tell me when you're ready, and I'll start our music. I got it all set up. Okay, it's where you want to. It's right there. Right there? Okay. You tell me when to press play. Make sure it works. There you go. Ready? Thank you. 
Thank you. We're going to yeah. move to lunch. invite my mother's dear friend and co-worker at Parksville Geriatric Day Center, Henry, to step up and say a few words. Henry, are you here? Oh, you're in the back. Henry's in the obstructed view seating, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Henry Durrani. I met Josephine in this building 20 years ago. I came as a volunteer, and uh, this is the first day we start to talk about everything. I realized how special lady she was. Very fair, very strict, but she had the big heart out. Uh, I worked with her for three, four years, and then I became a very good friend of her and her, her family too. The last three St. Patrick's, I was at <laughs> their house, enjoying her meals. And the, I'm Jack Daniel, so <laughs> <laughs> I love Josephine, I love them, and yeah. so thank you. So, you know, when we were kids, my mother drew a picture of Puff Magic Dragon that was so good, all of the kids in the neighborhood begged her for it. I think in the end, she drew about 10 for us to call her. And I know for a fact that until they moved to Pennsylvania in 1994, that drawing still hung framed on my childhood friend Maggie's wall. My mom was a talented woman in her own right, a phenomenal writer and artist. I was hoping to read something that she wrote, but she was also very good at hiding things. <laughs> so instead, I'm going to read you a piece that I wrote for her. Um, I am a moth with a torn wing, a broken, sad, and limping thing a smattering of dust upon the floor, wretched, motionless, and timid, dizzy in a world suddenly gone colorless and bleak. Never have I been so unsteady on my feet. The ground beneath me nips at me with jagged blades and tender teeth. I feel so small, so childish, and oh, so very meek. Now that the home and safety that I seek is wrapped in arms I cannot reach. I don't know how to start the day. I feel clueless regarding what to say. I am so lost regarding what to do. How can I reconcile that my memory is the only way that I can breathe life back into you? My heart aches, my body is sore. I've been shattered far too many times. I don't think that I can be fixed anymore. The sun now sheds, sets in shades of gray. My senses swirling and bereft, hiding fat from the sounds of glass, breaking in the aftermath of the hearts that collectively shattered on the day you left. I am a moth with a torn wing, a broken, sad, and limping thing who would give anything just to love you back into being. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My mom, now I'd like to do something that those of you who work or worked at or attend the New York Memory Center are very familiar with, but I will give a brief explanation for everyone else. A man named Gary Blazner started what's called the Alzheimer's Poetry Project, and he and my mother worked tremendously hard to make poetry part of the Memory Center programming. In addition to creating original poetry, the clients would have call and response poetry readings at the Memory Arts Cafe. And in honor of my mom's pet project, I thought we could all read a piece together that truly exemplifies my mother's selflessness. It's by one of her favorite poets, Emily Dickinson, and it's called Hope is the Thing with Feathers. What we're going to do, so everyone can enjoy the Alzheimer's Poetry Project with my mom one more time, is we are going to read this together. So I will say a line, and then you're going to say it back to me, okay? Here we go. Hope is the thing with feathers. Hope is the thing with feathers. That perches in the soul. That perches in the soul. And sings the tune without the words. And sings the tune without the words. And never stops at all. And never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard. And sweetest in the gale is heard. And sore must be the storm. And sore must be the storm. That could abash the little bird. That, the that kept so many warm. That kept so many warm. 
I've heard it in the chillest land. I've heard it in the chillest land. And on the strangest sea. And on the strangest sea. Yet never in extremity. Yet never in extremity. Did it ask a crumb of me. Did it ask a crumb of me. And now I would like to invite Mr. Joe Jamboy um, to say a few words about my mom. Joe, you were the head of the Board of Trustees at New York. Yeah. So I want to get that right. It's very important for you to get that right. <laughs> president, president, I'm president, sorry president. for saying that. I want to get that right for you. In other words, I was the guy that got into the room and laughed. I wrote down a, a couple of things that I wanted to say so that I didn't wander too far off. <laughs> It, it's, it's truly an honor to, to have this opportunity to speak a few words uh, in memory of Josephine. And so let me, let me do it. Friends and family, please accept my condolences on the passing of our friend and family member, Josephine. Her passing was so sudden that it remains fresh in my heart. And each time I hear about it, I relive the first hearing of, of the of our loss. I worked closely with Josephine. I actually started way back in, in the 19, 1990s um, and, and when we had the, uh, the facility up at uh, yeah, Prospect Park West and uh, dealing with that. Uh, and then, like I said, a couple of times I was the last person in the room or out of the room and I ended up being president. <laughs> Um, one of the things, though, is the, the last time I, I enjoyed this position, I worked with Josephine, and we met every Friday morning, and, and we would have coffee. That, that was I, either I would bring the coffee or she would have the coffee, and um, I enjoyed those coffees as we discussed the number of clients, the finances, how we would improve services, how we would raise money, what, what where we would go when we, we did travel over to uh, Bushwick. Uh, it, it, it really did work for a while, but it, it stressed us too far financially. But, but Josephine was up for it. She was up to try it. Let's, let's see if we could make it work. Um, what made all those meetings a pleasure was that Josephine was always herself at the meetings. There was no pretension. Uh, she was authentic. She was driven to care for those living with dementia. She was driven to provide services to all who needed it. She was devoted to everyone who came to our door. If there was a way to get people in and a way to pay for it, Josephine figured out the way, and it was going to get done. So today, I just want to say thank you. So the rest of this is really just to say thank you to Josephine, wherever she may be, hopefully in heaven, giving everybody their, their marching orders in their direction. <laughs> I want to say thank you, Josephine, for enriching our loved ones' lives. Thank you for supporting us. And when I'm speaking of us, of, of our, our clients, of our, our, of our guests and their family, thank you for supporting us when we felt exhausted and didn't know where we would get the energy to continue. Thank you for working with us when stress and depression threatened to take control of our lives. Thank you for being there for us when conversations with our doctors threatened to strip away whatever little hope we had for us and our loved ones. Thank you for being you. Josephine's life was about love, a love that transforms the, the lover and the loved one. Today, love must not be hidden. It must be living, active, and true. It makes the world a better place. Thank you, Josephine, for making the world a better place. Okay, now I would like to invite Debbie, another um, consult. What was, what was your title here? I didn't know. You, 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 oh, she would join us here to read something that another member of the other Memory Arts Cafe, Ismail, that also worked with her. Um, and she needs to be Consulted. Thank you. Well, Ismail um, Butera, who wrote this, um, he worked here for about at least two decades and was very, very, very close to Josephine. So he uh, yeah, wrote this remembrance. 
so I'll be speaking as a smile. My humble ap apologies for not being able to be present this evening. The life of a freelance musician is thus, and I was unable to get out of my already booked engagement. It bothers me some, for I have the utmost respect and regard for Josephine, who was one of a kind. I'm eased a bit when I think of what she might tell me in her sage-like wisdom and calm, embracing demeanor. It's okay, Pumpkin. You do what you gotta do. <laughs> I met Josephine and started to perform for her beloved clients some 20 years ago, and I immediately realized that she was a dedicated, compassionate, and caring individual. She loved her clients as well as her staff and reached out above and beyond to care for them all, ease their worries, and offer guidance and comfort when required. Her amazing ability to arrange a variety of programs and trips as well as seeing to it that everything ran like a clock, was always evident, all the while attending meetings and conferences, many out of town, that filled the days of her busy schedule. Every holiday or celebration saw the facility decorated with appropriate festive cheer, mm -hmm. and our programs reflected the particular holiday in our performances and our programs. My fellow musicians who performed at the annual Memory Center holiday party still recall looking forward to the warmth and joy of these events organized by Josephine. To work for Josephine at the Memory Center had one requirement, that you would become part of a family. And she was inspired, she inspired everyone to feel as though they were part of a family. My experience at the New York Memory Center was a wonderful experience indeed, thanks to the efforts and hard work of Josephine. She would come in early, around five in the morning on Wednesday, mm -hmm. the very day before Thanksgiving, and cook a lavish meal in which everyone, clients, their families, staff would partake. She was an amazing baker. And when I asked her how she learned to bake so well, she recounted the story of her younger days working in her uncle's famous bakery, D'Amico's, which I recall was a favorite of my own families, who used to frequent the bakery in the years before they moved from Brooklyn to Staten Island. Nowhere could you find better cannolis or spoon. Spoon it out. it out. it out. it out. It's like, there's only one word you won't get. <laughs> and I am more than sure that, that, that the polite young girl my mother always raved about when she shopped there working at the counter was none other than Josephine. Mm -hmm. Small world, me thinks. My life likes what likes to cruise. I never went on a cruise. I didn't think I would enjoy it, but Josephine converted me. <laughs> oh, go on a cruise with your wife. You're gonna love it, especially that you love history. There's so many places you would want to see. Just try it, she said. I looked, took her advice. Thanks. Thank you, Josephine. I now love cruising. <laughs> My wife Jan and I spend send our heartfelt condolences to her husband, Michael, and their beautiful daughters, Sarah and Joanna. Josephine was one of a kind, a unique and loving soul who will live on in the hearts of so many whom she touched with her magical blessings. We will miss her for sure, but the light of this amazing person will shine on eternally. John, my father's nephew, John Reardon, who's going to come up and play us a few songs um, in honor of my mom. <laughs> I know I snuck up on you, we're a little ahead of schedule, I'm sorry. <laughs> we can all take this as a moment to our dance machine. <laughs> <laughs> It's always the beach ring that's on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, why don't you play the whole week? Yeah, that's all right. Come on, play me too. 
So actually, uh, one of the caregivers who has known Josephine for a long time, and I don't have glasses, so I think I actually need to thank them. <laughs> <laughs> All the people who can't read without a glasses are just like, yeah, that's mine. <laughs> I appreciate all of you. Um, so he's known Josephine for a really long time. His wife has come here for many years. And this is what happens to a lot of folks who do come here. They come and they stay. Through all the progression that happens, they know that there's always a place for them here to be taken care of, someplace that's safe. And to a lot of folks, safety means a lot to make sure that nothing's going to happen to the person that they love and that the people that are in this facility, the staff and everybody that are here, care and everybody that comes here, we care about, we love, and we cherish because they need us. And George sent this in, so I'll read this. And it says, when I first spoke with Josephine, it was part of the process of my wife being enrolled to New York Memory Center. What I saw was not only great confidence and skill, but also that more elusive quality of authenticity. She really cared for the elderly who came to the center. She could sense their feelings of being lost in a world that had once been familiar and comfortable for them, and she understood and respected their hurt, which was sometimes expressed as angry indignation, and the fact that others now did it for them, what they've once been able to do for themselves. I dealt with Joseph, Josephine for about a decade, and I just can't remember from that whole period any time when I hadn't felt that she was both happy to be of help and happy to know both myself and my wife. From those years, three memories still out as exemplifying Josephine's special qualities. I guess it stood out. <laughs> Once when I was seeing her at the center, obviously I didn't read this before, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Once when I was seeing her at the center, she had an especially broad smile, and she told me that she had been, that it had been a good day for her. Her administrative responsibilities, and they were enormous, had been a bit less oppressive and she said, I can do my favorite thing, talk with clients. Josephine loved the clients. And she taught everybody here to love the clients. And that was something that is not easy to do. She had shared experiences with my wife about having cats in one's home, and they both enjoyed that conversation. <laughs> they were both cat names. Yeah. She knew when she had to use her authority to be the guardian of the client's best interest. And on the very rare times that I expressed concerns, Josephine heard what I said told me how she'd deal with it, and that problem then just ceased to be. She was able to help others by being at ease in her role as a leader. As far as I know, she gave a lot of people who had nowhere left to turn, a place to turn to, and that made her special. And though her leaving was a big change for the center, she left it in good hands with, the, uh, with Susan, <laughs> who cared as much about the members as Josephine did. I am glad I now have memories of seeing Josephine on 7th Avenue. It was by the bagel shop, by the way. <laughs> she told me all the time, after her retirement, and she asked how my wife was doing. When she retired, she had gone on to take care of herself, and I'm glad that she did. She deserved it. She earned that time to pursue, pursue her own interests, but the caring and concern for others did not diminish. The most lasting memorial to Josephine is how she provided leadership, which enabled others to grow professionally and to set an example on how to take on responsibilities in ways that were always caring and sensitive. With her death, we need to reflect on her life's achievements live on. George Schumacher. Now, before we close the evening, we'd just like to take a couple of minutes to invite anyone else who wants to get up and say a few words um, before we close the evening. So anybody who wants to get up and say something, the floor is yours. And if not, that's okay. No pressure. <laughs> Go eat some more snacks. No. <laughs> I don't want to put anything away. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Nitza. Um, I've been friends with Sarah since I was about, I think she was 14, I was 16. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know this is supposed to be mostly about what she's done for the memory center, but she's had a great impact on me. 
from the first time I came into her home to visit Sarah, she basically showed me where everything was and basically said, okay, now don't ask me where everything is again. <laughs> Next time you come, your family now, you, you go do whatever you want. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it was it was through that that I think it was either Mike or Joanna when I first time I called Sarah, got my name wrong. And called me Spritza, and that that has been my name. That's That's been my name ever since. Um, but more to the point here is when my mom got dementia. I mean, I went to Sarah immediately because she was going through it, and I forgot that her mom was doing this type of stuff. And when I was hearing people talking about what she what she did, and gave people hope, or didn't feel like we had any. She did help me. Um, she she somehow got my mom to be able to come at least for a few times. I don't know what they did. All I know is when she came home, I was like, "How'd you enjoy it?" I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was so much fun, and you know, and it was just so great. I was just so grateful to her to be able to. She got me to um, some of the um, support groups that were here. I was just talking to somebody about that. And it was just a refreshing thing because, you know, even within my own family, they didn't understand how difficult this was, for, especially for me, because I'm an only child. So I didn't have, my, my uncle was taking care of my grandmother, so I didn't have that support to, 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 to figure out how to handle all that was going on. And, you know, I, I'm trying not to break down here. Um, <laughs> When I when I when I heard that she left us, I was just like that was part of my brain was going, it's okay. My mom and my grandma take care of you. Just like you took care of her, she she'll be there to take care of you. And she came when my mom passed. She she came to the to the small wake that I had for her, gave flowers and everything and it meant the world to me to have her there. Um, so in the spirit of Josephine, I hope that Mike, Joanna, and especially Sarah, know that I'm here. Um, I'm a phone call away if you ever need anything. I wish I still lived in Brooklyn because I can come okay. and visit you more often, but I can't. Okay. But you are her extra kid. Yes. Yeah. One of yes. One of many. One of many. <laughs> yes, yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be so. I think, as we talk about cats, I think the reason that with Juno and now with Mickey, I talk to them the way I do <laughs> is because of your mother. <laughs> One of her cats loved every time I came over to go into my shoes. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, she loved going in my shoes. I have no idea. But anyway, I don't want to take a very <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, I, I'm going to do my best to make this short. She was the love <coughs> of my life. I met her when she was 16 and I was 19. So I shared so many different parts of life with her. I'm so heartbroken, she's gone. And my life will never be the same. But she brought so much love to everyone, and especially to me and my children. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, guys, there's plenty of food. If you want to snack, mingle, we got a little bit more time, please. That's the conclusion of our festivities for the evening. Thank you for everybody who participated. <laughs> Aunt Mary, I know you're watching. We love you. Oh, Susan has the blessing. Oh, Susan. I just do end stream, right? Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. No. Oh, you have no, no idea. Was no, Mary and I. You know, you see a. Uh, I sent Mary and the link. Click end. Yeah. Okay. Oop. <laughs>